on this Sabbath just after Thanksgiving. I would like to add one more item to your list for which to be thankful. I know it's been two days since you gathered with family and with friends, since you ate and you thought of and maybe shared the things for which you were grateful. Jesus right at the top of the list, family right after that, food, holidays, you're thankful for that now. A couple of weeks from now, you'll be thankful when they're gone. <laughs> maybe many items for which you were thankful. I would like to add just one to that list. To that list of reasons for gratitude, I would like to add this one. I am thankful that not every passage in the Bible is like the one Rod just read. I'm very thankful for that because it's a tough passage. As you sat there thinking, it's a wonderful day, a couple days after Thanksgiving, have family and friends, guests here. Wonderful day to go to church. Music is marvelous. Fellowship is wonderful. And then you sit down and hear the Scripture talking about fire and sulfur and brimstone and torture, and you say, have mercy. What in the world are we doing? Well, it's a difficult passage. This passage, the third of the three angels of Revelation 14. And since we've been looking at these three messages, and since today is the third, here we go with some gratitude that not every passage in the Bible is like this. Now, the key question we've been asking as we've been listening to these messages from the three angels has been the question, how do these messages help me to know more about how to prepare for the advent of Christ, for the return of Jesus? The first two angels have really helped us. The first angel said two words, basically, worship God. Those who are waiting in readiness for the coming of Christ will be those not only who experience worship in a place like this, but whose whole lives are given in worship to God. Worship God. Second angel last week helped us by saying one of the key ways to be ready for the advent of Christ is to remember that Jesus and Jesus alone is the author of salvation. Our salvation comes from him and depends on him. Let not the gospel be diluted or confused on that point. And then today we come to the third. Same question, how does this message help us prepare for the advent of Christ? Now, as we read through the message, as we heard it read, we thought, oh my, all of this cataclysmic judgment that we hear happening. I don't know how that's going to help me other than to scare me, and fear is not a good motivator. So how does it help me? Well, maybe the place to begin is to recognize that the book of Revelation, this last missive in Scripture, is a book that is filled with both metaphorical language and literal language. It's very important then to begin to sort through what is metaphorical, what stands for something else, and what it is that we are to take literally. Now, one of the most simple and maybe helpful rules to follow is this rule. As you read Revelation, take literally what you can. And if it clearly cannot be taken literally, then it is probably symbolic, metaphorical. For example, when you stand on the edge of the ocean and coming up out of the ocean is a beast with seven heads and ten horns, you immediately realize that's not real. That's a metaphor standing for something else. Or even these angels flying in midair, calling out in a loud voice the message of which echoes throughout the earth. A metaphor, symbolizing, no doubt, the message that is to go out. After all, the Greek word angel means, at its basic meaning, messenger. So it is a message that is to go out. And yet when you pause and look at the messages, for example, the first one, and you see that it says, fear God, give him glory, and worship him. You say, that's something that I can take literally. So maybe the first exercise is to distinguish between metaphor, that which stands for something, and the real and the practical. So what about this third angel's message? We read some rough things in there. You heard them as Rod read them. Well, consider these. First of all, start out with the mark. It says, there will be a mark. You've seen them probably, I know I have, on the checkout stand at the supermarket, messages about the mark of the beast. You see people with barcodes in their foreheads or on their hands, some literal mark that is going to set people aside. 
The mark is metaphorical, placed on the forehead to mean these people have in their minds agreed with the beast power. We will go along with that because we agree with it. Or on the hand, these people have said, we'll go along to get along. We'll do what's necessary in order to survive. Or what about fire? You read about fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and of the holy angels. What an awful scene. Until you pause to consider that the first readers of John's letter, the first ones to hear it, were those who knew what it was to suffer under the crush of imperial Rome's heavy boot as it squashed out their lives. They were the ones who, in front of hundreds and thousands of Roman glitterati, would suffer the vengeance of Rome for their faith. It must have been a profound comfort to them to know that the day would come when God's judgment would rule in their favor and all the world, all the universe would know, everyone would see it. That day was coming. It must have been a comfort to them. Or what about that smoke of their torment ascending forever and ever? Is that talking about eternal torment and punishment? Well, remember that the book of Revelation is best understood in the context of the Old Testament. In fact, scholars tell us that of the 404 verses in the entire book, 278 of them have direct allusions to or are direct quotations from the Old Testament. So sometimes if you say, I don't understand what's here, turning back here will help you understand in the original context. So let's take that one example, the smoke of their torment ascending forever and ever. What is that symbolic of? Many scholars point to Isaiah 34 as being the place from which John the Revelator would have drawn the language. It's in that context that Isaiah is talking about the destruction of Edom. Listen to what Isaiah says, Isaiah 34, 9 and 10. Edom's streams will be turned into pitch, her dust into burning sulfur, her land will become blazing pitch. It will not be quenched night or day. Its smoke will rise forever. From generation to generation, it will lie desolate. No one will ever pass through it again. So when Isaiah uses the language, he is talking clearly about total annihilation, complete destruction. It will lie desolate, he says. No one will ever inhabit it again as its smoke rises forever and ever. So the third angel is painting a scene a scene where complete destruction will come. And then finally, what about that wine? The wine of God's fury poured unmixed into the cup of his indignation. Is that metaphorical? Certainly we don't believe a day will come, a time will come when goblets will be handed out to every member of the human race, and into each of those goblets will be poured the wine of God's fury. No, it's a metaphor. A metaphor that if you're drinking the wine of Babylon, be careful because there's a worse wine that you could actually drink. So as we sort through the metaphorical language and imagery of the third angel's message, where does that leave us? Well, that part of it leaves us with this. There is coming a day when God will finally move to end in judgment. There is coming a day when human beings will have to be called to account for their actions. And we are on the way to that day making decisions of eternal consequence, especially decisions related to worship. After all, this message begins, if anyone worships. It comes to that word that is key to the understanding of the entire book of Revelation. It centers on worship. So we say, okay, I get that part. There's, we're making decisions. There's coming a day, eternal consequences. I have to make decisions about who it is that I will worship in the context of Revelation. But can we be more specific about this third angel? Well, we can but let me remind you that as you read Revelation, one of the most important choices you can make is to keep the entire sweep in view. 
Look at the entire sweep of what it says. Things like this. It's going to get a whole lot worse before it gets a whole lot better. The distinction between those who follow the lamb and those who follow the beast will become increasingly distinct. And in the end, the lamb wins. Keep those broad brushstrokes in mind. Because the truth is, throughout 2,000 years of Christian history, People have gotten so attached to details, details that have usually been wrong, that they've missed out on the bigger picture. So with that in mind, I want to, I want to invite you to think about three pictures, three scenes, three stages, if you will. The first stage is a universal stage. Picture or look at the universe. The universe is there. This is the backstory, the backdrop for the entire story of the Bible and certainly for the story of Revelation. If you have that image in your mind of the universe, then picture the word superimposed, Christ versus Satan. This is what Adventists have often called the great controversy. This is the backstory that began before us, of which we were not a part in the beginning. But it's that struggle between light and darkness, between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. That looms in the background of the book of Revelation. But the book tells us that it didn't just stay in the background. Listen to these words. Revelation chapter 12, beginning with verse 7, says this. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So now we move from a universal picture to a global picture. It has just moved closer to us. From that Christ versus Satan view of the universe, we now move to a view of the globe that says the dragon versus the lamb. Now we get more specifically into Revelation itself. We come closer to what is behind this third angel's message. In other words, those two forces sought agents here on earth, those agents who would carry out their will, further their purposes. Now we come closer to where we live. But that's a reality over which we have no control. It will come even closer to us because the Lamb seeks those who will carry out its will. That's the church in Revelation often spoken of as the woman. So too will the dragon. Among other unsavory characters, one of the key characters the dragon chooses to work through is the beast. And so finally, we end up on a very intimate, specific stage, the beast versus you and me. This is at its most individual. The huge picture, universal behind us, the global picture, and now the intimate picture where you and I live our lives. Now, the truth is, we have spent much time on that second stage. Much time figuring out who is this beast that the dragon chooses to use. And it's understandable. It's understandable that we would want to know who it is, though different answers have been given. In the very earliest days, when John the Revelator wrote his vision out, the people who read and who heard that vision undoubtedly thought of the beast as imperial Rome, that power that was trying to annihilate them. It was imperial Rome. There is the beast. They spoke of it in cold language so as not to suffer even further danger. But then the world did not end. Time forged ahead. And it wasn't long before riding in that vehicle called now, people moved forward enough that imperial Rome dropped off the map. Come up several hundred years, closer to our time, come to the time of the Protestant reformers. You can verify this. It is as far away as your nearest Google search. Read what the Protestant reformers said because they moved their focus from imperial Rome to papal Rome. And in their day and time, it made absolute sense. 
The destructiveness, the clutching on to power, the do-it-yourself religion was very much in evidence. When you do your Google search, be careful. You may not be quite prepared for the white-hot heat of their words, how they characterized this beast power that they saw in papal Rome. And yet time continues forward. Now we as Adventists are a smaller river out of that great Protestant river. We have drawn deeply from that source and have affirmed that conviction from our very earliest days. But we've been very concerned to identify the beast. Some have said it's something else. If you take the time to look, you will see from the most serious scholarship to the most absurd guessing as to who the beast is. In fact, as I was making preparation for today, I remembered something from 30 years ago, 20 years ago, and I thought, I wonder if that's still around. And so I sat down with Google, and I typed in the name Ronald Reagan, and right there, first one that showed up was Ronald Reagan as the beast. And I started looking at that, and sure enough, there were all the old things that were being said back decades ago about Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, they said, was the beast. After all, Ronald Wilson Reagan, three names, each has six letters, 666. (laughs) That beast had a deadly wound that was healed. There it was. That beast had a, well, I'll clean it up a little bit, a wife who loved to wear red, who was all about how she dressed and how she looked, who got involved with astrologers, and to top it all off, that beast, after his retirement, moved to Sunrise Way, address 666, although his wife said change it to 668. It's all there. The most absurd. I even found one who posted and said, I was sure that was it. In fact, he said, I was sure that George H.W. Bush would erect an image to that beast and force people to worship it. I was so disappointed when he didn't. But then, George W. was elected, and my hope was revived. (laughs) Can you imagine? All kinds of guesses, scholarship, worries. Who is the beast? Let's identify the beast. Be careful for the beast. May I point out something? That dragon who works through that beast is nothing if not wily and cunning, crafty, willing to morph and to change, to disguise, to work through any available agency. Maybe rather than worrying so much about who the beast is, we ought to have a greater concern about how to inoculate ourselves from the dragon's virus. In fact, again, going back a few years now, some of you will remember as it happened back in the 80s, there was a new disease appearing on the scene. It had people deeply worried. This was a disease that would ultimately become known as AIDS. Some of you will remember because you read about it in the paper, saw it on the evening news. Others will remember because you were actually involved in research and caring for patients with AIDS. But it was a vivid reality in the American consciousness and no doubt internationally as well. A lot of uncertainty, many questions, people frightened. How do you contract it? Can you contract it by shaking someone's hand or by a kiss or public restroom or water fountain? A lot of fear going around at that point in time. During that time, I remember having a conversation with a health care provider, asking him, Our conversation turned to what was much in the news at that time, asking him a bit about the AIDS story and what was going on. He said, well, it's been largely evident in three groups of people. At that time, that was the case here in this country. It's been largely evident in the male gay community, largely evident in the IV drug abusing community, as well as thirdly evident in those who have hemophilia. Those are the communities in which it has been most evident. So I asked him, well, what about other people? Are there, is there cause for concern for others? He said, well, we don't know much yet about all that causes it and how it spreads and all the rest, but rest assured of this, he said. Rest assured of this. That virus doesn't stop on the way in and ask you, are you part of one of these three communities? You're not? Oh, sorry. Well, I'll have to move on. Then let me find somebody who is 
part of one of those three. He said, it doesn't do that. That virus will look for any host where it has access. It doesn't matter to which community you belong if it can find access. And as I think back, I almost want to ask, was I talking to a health care provider or was I talking to a theologian about the beast? Because make sure you understand that dragon's virus which works through the beast doesn't care what community you happen to be a part of. It doesn't stop on the way in and say, or, is your name on the rolls of this church? Is your name on the text of this community? It is? Okay, you're, it's not? Then I'll move on. Absolutely not. It is willing to find a lodging in anyone where there is access. So the question becomes, where is their access? Are there certain groups or communities that are more predisposed? Absolutely. Those who are all about do-it-yourself religion or who are about using religion as a powerful tool to oppress others, there are certain groups that are more predisposed, but it will go anywhere it can. What concerns me most is how to avoid the virus. How do I do that? And if that concerns you, then I would say there's good news. There's good news because a third angel flew in the midst of heaven and cried out a message. And at the end of that message, when the symbolic language was finished, that angel turned to something that you can take literally and specifically. I want to read you those words, those closing words of that third angel's message, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. After all this has gone before, it's as though he says, do you want to know how to avoid it? Do you want to know how to make preparation for the advent of Christ? Verse 12, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Three things. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and who remain faithful to Jesus. Do you want to know how to avoid the dragon's virus administered through the beast, regardless of who it is or how it functions? Three things. Patient endurance, obedience to God's commands, remain faithful to Jesus. Number one, patient endurance. It's as though that angel wants us to know that this journey with Jesus is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Don't think that it's going to take just some desire and that will get you there. No, he says, it is patient endurance that will be required. It is almost as though John the Revelator is drawing on the imagery of the writer to the letter to the Hebrews when that writer said, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It will require patient endurance. In fact, I have a question for you. We're almost to December. About 11 months of this year have slipped into the rearview mirror. My question is, is your walk, is your journey with Jesus deeper today than it was at the beginning of 2012? As you have lived the 11 months of this year, have you opened your heart and your life more fully to Jesus and said more clearly to him, Oh, Jesus, be at home in my heart in my life. Become increasingly comfortable here. Make this your abode. 
You are welcome to every facet of it. Open the closets, the drawers. Help me clean out that which needs to be cleaned. Just make yourself at home here for the long haul. This is not your hotel, Jesus. This is your abode. Have you deepened in that way with him? As you look over the last 11 months of this year, is your spiritual life less of an up-and-down, jagged reality, and has it begun to even out some as you move toward deeper maturity in Christ? As you consider where your journey is with Jesus, can you honestly say it has greater flavors of patient endurance than it ever has before? We're not in a sprint. We are in a long-haul race. I cannot tell you if Jesus will come a day, a week, a month, a year, or 100 years from now, but it ought not matter because we're in it for the long haul, regardless of when he returns. That's what's called patient endurance. I love the words of the venerable old Scottish scholar William Barclay who reminds us of commitment and patient endurance with these words. It is possible, he writes, to be a follower of Jesus without being a disciple, to be, as it were, a camp-out follower without being a soldier of the king, to be a hanger-on in some great work without pulling one's weight. Once someone was talking to a great scholar, he writes, about a younger man. He said, so-and-so tells me that he was one of your students. The teacher answered devastatingly. He may have attended my lectures, but he was not one of my students. There's a world of difference, says Barclay, between attending lectures and being a student. It is one of the supreme handicaps of the church that in the church there are so many distant followers of Jesus and so few real disciples. Real disciples are in it for the long haul. Their lives are characterized by patient endurance. I look at my parents, Bob and Betty Roberts, married 66 years. Their early marriage characterized by a decision that said, we will go straight to the mission field, we will bypass seminary because we believe the coming of Christ is that close. Decades, decades later, here we are. And yet there they are, hearts still faithful. In it, for the long haul. The angel said, patient endurance. We sometimes flag our weary souls by saying, it's almost here, it's just around the corner. I have to tell you honestly, I draw back from such language and such imagery because I don't know and because at an even deeper level, it ought not matter. When he comes, if our lives are characterized by patient endurance. You want to know how to prepare for the Advent? Heed the third angel's message. Patient endurance is number one. Number two is clear. Obey God's commandments. The TNIV says obeying His commands. Now we noticed last week something that is keenly important for this statement, and that is this. The gospel and God himself are not opposed to effort. They are opposed to merit, to earning. But make no mistake about it, if one is to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ that he has worked into our hearts and lives, that requires effort. When it comes time to obey God's commands, make no mistake about it, there will at times be hard choices, at times difficult decisions, at times difficult days that we have to face, but never to earn it. We are accepted as we are in the Beloved. Now the living out of that will sometimes be a great challenge. 
So maybe you say, well, what commands? What commandments is he talking about? Well, a good place to start is with the central command of all of Scripture, and that is the command to love. Or break it into two, as Jesus did when asked, what is the greatest commandment? He says, the greatest commandment is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself is the second. So it starts out with saying, do I love God more deeply, more truly, more selflessly than I did yesterday, last month, last year? Am I deepening in obedience to his command? And then he says, your neighbor as yourself. That's not a suggestion. That's a commandment of Scripture. It's not trying to command our emotions. It is trying to command our choices. Well, you say, I don't know what all that means. Well, then go to the Ten Commandments. There are four at the beginning, talk about loving God. Six at the end, talk about loving others. And since we're in the context of Revelation, where worship is the key issue, Maybe you want to especially pay attention to any commandments that have to do with the worship of the one who created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. If you still are uncertain of how to love God and others, there's a pretty good book, a whole book that helps us sort that out. What does it mean to love? Do you want to be prepared for the coming of Christ? Today, you can be responding to Jesus by his love and his grace and then saying, plant within me that virtue, that ethic of love that loves you and loves others and uses love as the touchstone for all of my decisions in life. That will be obeying God's commands. Three things, the angel said. Patient endurance obeying God's commands. And then thirdly, this third one, I, I, I would almost say this one summarizes all three of them and puts it in a very simple way so that even I can grasp it. That third one, the angel said, remain faithful to Jesus. When you look at the story of Revelation, that story where the Lamb has been so faithful to us, faithful to the point of death, faithful to the point of feeling absolutely cut off from his Father, faithful to the point of resurrection and being able to say, I have the keys of life and of death. He has been utterly faithful to us. Now the call is issued that says, now you, you remain faithful to him. Begging the patient endurance of some of you with whom I've shared this. When I think about that remaining faithful to Jesus, my mind goes back. Fair number of years, I was a young pastor, was serving as camp pastor one week at a junior camp. The last day of the camp, Sabbath afternoon, the counselors and other leaders at the camp had planned a special activity for the kids. They wanted them to do something by which they were going to draw an important object lesson at Vespers at the campfire that evening. So here's what they had decided. We're going to go on a hike, fairly long hike. It's about a five or six mile hike. And we're going to send cabins out one at a time. One at a time with some very specific instructions. Every cabin will be accompanied by two adults. The kids have been told and will be told again and told repeatedly, no matter what happens, stay with your counselor. No matter what anybody says, stay with your counselor. No matter who else may come, join you, say anything else, stay with your counselor. Very clear instructions. What the kids did not know was that they had gotten together with those of us who were the second adult in each group. And they had told us, now we want you to do something very important to the object lesson we're going to draw later. We want you all to try to draw away those kids, get them to follow you, and leave their counselors. <laughs> so I can do that. I'll be happy to try that. And so they got everything ready, and then they started sending them out one cabin at a time. We were a ways down the list, but our moment finally came. We were ready to go. Off we went on the hike, following the trail. 
We had one child in our group that had apparently sprained his ankle earlier in the week, couldn't walk very fast, was kind of hobbled as we went along. I quickly realized this is going to be a very long hike with this child going that slowly. So about 100 yards in to the walk, I took off running, turned and shouted over my shoulder, this is going to take us way too long. We've got to beat the others back. Let's go. And I took off running. I hardly dared to look back and see if any had followed me. But when I did, with the exception of the injured child, every child was running after me, <laughs> every single one. Off we went down the path, running, racing to get there first. Do you know that on that walk, we passed counselor after cabin after counselor, every single one of which had face defections. We passed one or two counselors walking by themselves. <laughs> the instructions were very clear. No matter what happens, no matter who says anything, stay with your counselor. When we got back and they found out, they were livid. They looked at me and said, but you're the pastor. <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> and the angel flew in midair and said, no matter what happens, no matter what the dragon does, no matter what the beast does, no matter what churches say, no matter what humans may write or do, stay with your counselor. Don't allow anything to cut you off. Anything that anybody says, don't allow that to happen, says the angel, because the reality is it's all about Jesus and you. There is the big picture, Christ versus Satan. You can't make a difference there. There's the bigger but not as big of a picture that says the lamb versus the dragon. You can't even make a difference there. But when it comes down to you and the beast, stay with your counselor. Do not allow anything to come between you. As that writer to Hebrews said, run with patience the race, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith. They remain faithful to Jesus, said the angel. And in remaining faithful to him, there was born within them a patient endurance that expressed itself in obeying the commandments of God. I don't know about you. I would love to see him face to face just as soon as is possible. But I can tell you this. It is the settled purpose of my life. No matter when that occurs, to stay with my counselor. Because the reality is, for those who are in the grip of his grace, for those who with all their spiritual strength cling tightly to his hand, the day will come when face to face he will look at them and say, Welcome home, children. Welcome home. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the very foundation of the world. Amen.